Soccer Today is powered by Spin Media. From podcast to video production, visit SpinMediaDigitalSolutions.com and bring your content to the next level. Ya lo hace. Pierna derecha, directo al arco. Golazo. 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 The world of football with a soccer perspective. This is Soccer Today with Dwayne Rollins and Kevin Laramie, live on the Sports Podcasting Network. Good day, good night, and welcome to Soccer Today for September 19, 2022. I'm Kevin Laramie, and I'll be joined by Dwayne Rollins in a second as we invite you to subscribe to our YouTube page to make sure you never forget any of our podcasts and subscribe to our Two Solitudes Patreon page where we will have later this week more coverage on the Canadian men's national team the friendlies it is right now the international break and we will have more coverage later this week when it comes to the Canadian men's national team and the other friendlies that will take place on the road to Qatar today we will break down the roster of Canada and talk about their schedule we will also talk about Vanessa Gilles a little bit later she's on her way to Europe leaving the Los Angelinos or Angel FC from Los Angeles and we will talk about that but first Dwayne, we're back. How are you today? Doing pretty well. Uh, I played soccer. I played the beautiful sport of soccer that we talk about every day for the first time since March 7th, 2020. Anyone with a uh, bit of a knack for recent history might might know their significance to that date or more specifically just a little past that date. Uh, I uh, don't know what you're talking about. What happened in the last two years? I don't know. But uh, to yeah. reminisce of better times, I'm wearing, Dwayne, my uh, World Cup 1994 sweatshirt. Yes, a sweater made of nice and uh, beautiful cotton. And it's from 1994 in Columbus, Ohio. And I'm wearing this proudly. Of course, I didn't go there in 1994, but, you know, thrift shop near you, I found this beauty. And I'm wearing it proudly today. I have a 94 t-shirt that I wore to the Panama game that Alfonso Davies scored that crazy goal at. So so maybe it is good luck. I'm also wearing the, uh, if you're seeing on video, the the uh, inaugural game uh, hat from the Canadian Premier League, which uh, we won't talk about the KPL today, but maybe later this week. Yes, and of course, uh, we are back here. This is the first show we've been doing with the new setup that uh, we have here. So if there's any little troubles here and there just bear with us this is the first full paced show so with all the graphics and the board and the video transition and everything we're putting my new system through its paces hopefully it is seamless and it looks great Dwayne it is the weekend review it is Monday after all and it's a busy show so let's start by looking at what happened in Major League Soccer over the weekend it was a full weekend of play 14 games across the board it all started with a rivalry game between the two New York teams, NYCFC versus New York. And New York won 2 0 against New York, but the blue and not the red. And NYCFC needed that result to keep pace in the Eastern Conference. They are fourth, they're still fourth, and we'll talk about that later when we talk about the potential result. But as you can see on your screen, outside of Orlando, Toronto, New England, Montreal, and Vancouver, Seattle, that we would break down statistically, what stands out to you? Well, obviously, I think that New York City FC game, the, the derby that you mentioned to the Hudson River derby, uh, if you prefer it, I think it does jump out uh, in terms of the fact that New York City FC had not really been doing all that well for a while. And, and to get a big win over the rivals, I think, is a confidence booster for them. Um, I think Montreal winning again, it, it should stand out too. Not in the dramatic way of any specific game, because as, as I've said all, well, not all year, but recently, uh, see if Montreal is not so much about about any one moment or any one player or any one uh, result. It's about this cumulative result, which just grinds and grinds and grinds and gets gets results after each one. I thought Philadelphia, if you saw Andre Blake's performance on the weekend, I thought that was remarkable and shows that that's a team that might have the grit to, to grind through a result on the road in the playoffs if they have to play a result on the road in the playoffs, which seems like unlikely in the Eastern Conference up until perhaps the uh, the, the, the Sporters Shield, which LAFC kind of took control of a bit this weekend with uh, Philly dropping some points. But uh, yeah, uh, we're getting to the, the tail end. The other thing that jumps out to me is not on a positive, though, Kevin, and that's, uh, you know, certain teams mailing it in at the end of the year. I, I you know, as I said <laughs> the other day, I, I don't know how much more patience I have to watch TFC for the rest of this yeah. year. But Yeah, and, uh, you know, sometimes bad habits stay, and I'm afraid that some of the bad habits that TFC might pick up this year 
uh, stay for next year. Hopefully the Italian and everybody involved don't have a hard year next year. As we now can talk about Montreal, Dwayne, because Montreal is assured to finish second in the Eastern Conference. They have been lights out this season. It has been a surprise for a lot, but it's quite an adventure. And Montreal is record holder in MLS with the San Jose Earthquake. Montreal, with the victory in Foxborough on Saturday, was able to not only get a win in three points and assure the second spot, but they are record holder for six straight games winning on the road. Only the San Jose Earthquakes of 2005 with, of course, your namesake, Dwayne De Rosario in 2005. That was the great years of Dero. You know, that famous free kick. That's during that period, too. Unbeaten for six and winning for six on the road. But CF Montreal has done that. But maybe let's look at New England for a second, Dwayne, because to me, it is a team that's mailing it in in the end of the season. We'll look at the standings in a second. It was their fifth loss in their last seven games in MLS. Their third straight losses, even though Carles Gil has been joined by his brother, Uncle Bruce Arena, is putting this team through the ground. He's... Maybe this is going to be the worst year in his entire career in MLS. He's not only not going to make the playoffs, he's going to be officially eliminated the next time they play. It was a terrible showing by New England. And I have to say, the entire building of this team since the offseason that just passed was questionable. The managing of this team is questionable and the results are laughable. I, uh, I'd i have to go look, and I don't have that offhand. Maybe you might look at it in the future, too. They're minus 34 points right now from last year's season, and we'd have to go see what the biggest drop in, in MLS history is from one, one season to the next in terms of a drop-off. I know the biggest rise is DC United went from their crazy 13-point season to, like, a decent season, so that's it's a, pretty easy to have a good rise when you have 13 points in a season. But, but to drop from 72 points, the all-time record, down to 38, as Kevin said, the tragic number, the number to be eliminated, it is three so you you know they have to win out and hope a whole bunch of teams have a whole lot of funny things happen and in fact if you look at the schedule i would bet that there it might not even be possible now really because teams play each other right but uh you know when you're you're tied to the expansion team and you were the supporter shield winners and the all-time record holders last year and that's you know tejan is a great player and we love him here but is that's not the only difference right and and like what's no, happened exactly. here it, yeah I know it's a terrible, terrible season for New England. That is 11th right now with 38 points after 32 games played. They have two games left, as most teams in the Eastern Conference. Let's look at uh, the standings, Dwayne. Philly, Montreal, New York have punched the tickets for the standings. Montreal is officially second. They cannot move from there. So Philly will be first. Montreal will be second, nine points ahead of New York, quite impressively. They have played really well lately, Montreal. New York, NYCFC, Orlando, Cincinnati, and Miami would take part in the playoffs. And Dwayne, we've talked about Montreal. Let's look now at what the bracket would look like in the Eastern Conference if it was to start today. We debut our brand new graphics about the playoffs and I'm really happy to show you this graphic we've been working hard behind the scenes rebuilding the show and showing you this Montreal would face Miami with their great victory this weekend Montreal would face Inter Miami in Montreal at Satsuputo in the cold in October why not New York Cincinnati would be the other matchup NYCFC Orlando would be the other one and Philly would have a bye Philly would then play the winner of NYCFC or Orlando Montreal would play the winner of New York or Cincinnati of course Montreal would have home field advantage all the way to the Eastern Conference final if Philly were to make it there if not Montreal could even host MLS Cup who knows but this is quite a remarkable stretch Montreal is on and if we go back to this victory this was full measure and alistair johnston captain canada in the future Dwayne, you've heard it here first he will be named captain of the national team one day yeah well lots to talk about the national team in the days ahead and later on the show in fact look the montreal as you mentioned 
we talked last year when we just talked about New England a minute ago that that buy, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I can trace back, and I did last year at this time, and trace back that the teams coming off the bye week have not necessarily done that well. And that's despite the fact that they were always the better team, clearly, because they had the highest point total. But having that week off is not necessarily a good thing. So if Philadelphia gets knocked off early, and that's not an easy side of the bracket the way it looks right now, and that can yeah. change, obviously then certainly it does open it wide open and, and you know, Montreal with the cold weather advantage uh, might be able to do something. Now, I don't know if they were to play MLS Cup. Do you think they played in Saputo? Can they play in Saputo? I guess they could sure. this year. Yeah, they could because it's in November and uh, they played November games in Saputo before. It was kind of cold. But I would really like it and that's what the players would like. Players like Alistair Johnston and others are talking about Saputo being their homes and wanting to play there in the playoffs. And you know what? Might as well. It's enjoyable. You're going to play this last time with a uh, snowflake on the chest. Might as well play in the snow. Why not? Speaking of Alistair Johnston, he is the goal scorer. He's the reason why Montreal won this game in Foxborough. He also has been unequivocally one of the... That's a big word that I just pulled off, so thank you for that. But uh, that is really one of the best defenders in Canada and in CONCACAF this season. For the national team and for CF Montreal... From a great season last year with Nashville, he was able to double down and add some offense to it. We now have Alistair Johnston, one of the best right wing back in the league. A meteoric rise to success. He's been a mainstay in the starting 11 for CF Montreal and the Canadian Men's National Team. And as we see his statistics on the screen, 84% passing accuracy. To me, the shot creating actions, 47. He is 6 for CF Montreal is really important because that means that he's contributing from the wing back position and in the system of Wilfred Nancy as we can look and see on our screen right now that position is really useful he has a lot of tackles too he's responsible defensively and if we look at the formation here Alistair Johnston being used as a right wing back as a midfielder or a corridor type player even defender sometimes that's where he's really useful and we see his contribution for Montreal and of course he will be a big part of Canada's future success yes future success in Qatar uh, yeah well that's the hope but uh, well, there could be success in Qatar on Friday we'll uh, we'll see but uh no Elster Johnson I'll tell you this to get away from Montreal for just a half second I knew Canada was going to go do just fine in, in World Cup qualifying early on it was a Honduras game Watching Alistair Johnson at the back sweep over from that left position and just do some backup plays, do some really basic, easy, effective work at the back, defending really well, defending very solid, while also getting up in the attack and helping that transition game sort of get forward. And that was the moment I went, okay, we found this guy. And then that helps all the rest of the teams, uh, you know, the rest of the players sort of work. We'll talk about Ken in the second half. But but obviously Montreal getting him this year was was a big coup for them and sort of illustrates that I don't know whether they internally were listening to you, Kevin, and, and realized that they needed to go for it this year because I think that as much as we want to talk about the important contribution Alistair Johnson has had to Montreal this year, I don't think that the contribution next year is going to be as easy to quantify because it's going to be a whole bunch of money in their pocket after he plays in the World Cup in November and presses there. Um, I suspect he might move to Europe and that's his dream and that will benefit Montreal if they spend that money right. Lots yeah. of time to talk with them moving forward because they have a playoff run to focus on first. And, and look, if you could, I say this a million times, I'm not going to back it off. You need to find goals in the playoffs. Goals win games. The attacking teams win this more often than not. But Montreal does, has proven that they can defend. They can find team goals. If they can do that consistently and they take advantage of that cold, bitter weather in Montreal, which is, you know, Toronto did a bit of that in the playoff run they had in, in 16 and 17 too. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's, a, it's an opportunity to be had there for sure. All right, let's move to Toronto. We're not going to spend too much time on Toronto, of course, because, but, you know, I wanted to say they, uh, they lost again, Twain. And uh, with that, they are officially... Eliminated from the playoffs, they will not play this year in the postseason. They will not win a trophy in the playoffs in MLS or even a trophy period this season. Toronto eliminated from the playoffs. Facundo Torres, Erkan Cara, Lucas McNaughton in his own goal, and Tesho Akindele. Tesho really plays well against Canadian team, Dwayne. It's either Montreal or Toronto. Tesho always finds the way to score a goal late, even though he plays barely anymore, he finds ways to beat Canadian team. Any final thought? Any eulogy for Toronto? Well, you have it highlighted on the graphic there that that one XG compared to the actual XG of four, which tells me that they're making 
either one of two things is happening. Either Orlando is having a remarkable offensive game and they're scoring wonder goals, or having watched TFC all year, uh, the more likely scenario here is that TFC is just is making stupid errors that lead to half chances that to turn into full chances that turn into goals. Look, there are three teams at MLS that have allowed 60 or more goals this year so far. Toronto, uh, San Jose, and D.C. United. That is the lad, the wooden spoon winning team or leading team, the second place wood, in wooden spoon race, and the fourth place team in the wooden spoon race. You can't allow 60 goals in a season. <laughs> Only Houston is in there. Houston's allowed 56 goals, so it's not like they're much better, right? No, so that's, exactly. That's yeah, where, right. yeah, you can't allow that many goals. It's, you know, TFC has a nice attack that even this year, even in the early parts of the year before the and the Italians got there, they had some nice attacking play, but they just couldn't defend, and that hasn't really changed itself how do you fix that i mean the easy solution is to sign some veteran mls center halves that's what people will say i don't know if it's that simple i mean there's a lot of moving parts here i think you've got to look at bradley's play overall i don't think bradley's as bad as people some people want to say but he's also not the answer as a six anymore not 34 games playing 90 minutes he isn't so you got to figure that out i i don't want to bash bono anymore but, you know, my position on the keeping there and Sean Johnson and OCFC, you know, all-star, perhaps the third keeper for Qatar for the, uh, for, uh, the U.S. We'll see. He He's going to be a free agent in the offseason. Just saying. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> well, Ooh, that's the trap with the money. <laughs> yeah. Westberg is not the answer either, you know. And we're seeing Westberg oh. play now back. Uh, Westberg played the last game. You just saw the standings and the formation on your screen of TFC's last match. And Westberg was in the net. But wasn't really a big difference there. And yes, the XG was a big difference. Only one XG for Orlando, but they scored four. That's also maybe the season of Toronto in a nutshell. And we'll see if next year, players like Insigne, Bernadeschi, and whoever else is Crescito, and of course, whoever else comes in in a TAM position or in a just regular player position would help the team. So that's something that is very probably important in the offseason is to reassure the defense, change the goalkeeping situation, and make Toronto a better team defensively. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we will be talking about Vancouver's big win against Seattle. Vancouver is now still in a playoff hunt, but still a little bit far away. We're going to talk about this in the Western Conference side, the bracket, and the standings, and more after this short break. You are listening to Soccer Today. Follow us on Twitter at Soccer Today SPN and like our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash sports podcasting network. And we're back on Soccer Today. Kevin Laramie here inviting you to take a second out of your day and just subscribe to our YouTube channel. This is something that really helps us with the algorithm. We're trying to grow and bring this channel to a thousand subscribers so that we get even more notifications and more, of course, subscriptions and better reviews and rating because of your listeners also. So thank you very much. Uh, my whole sentence did not make sense, but you know, it's Monday. I got a little case of the Mondays and I appreciate your subscription. Thank you for listening. Also, Dwayne, as we say thank you to our patrons at patreon.com slash two solitudes, Pierre, Patrick, Martin, Jordan, Ian, Gonzalo, Gladzimir, Dennis, Daniel, Sean, and let's go, boys! Blue Collar Dan, who's listening right now, hello and welcome back to our channel. As we talk about the Vancouver Whitecaps, when the Vancouver Whitecaps are still alive, they're not dead yet, their demises have been written maybe a bit early, but it may be a little too little too late. Quite a playoff battle between those two teams, Vancouver, Seattle at BC Place, 2-1 victory for Vancouver. It could be interesting, but it is maybe too little too late. What is your thought on this game? And also, let's mention, Pedro Vite finally scored his first for Vancouver after over a year with the club. Um, you know, like the little shrug emoji that you put down on your phone sometimes when you think, I don't know. Yeah, that, that's my thoughts on the White Caps. They're minus 17 goal differential. That's third worst in the league. They should not be anywhere close to the playoff line, but here we are. 
uh, just like last year. But look, I don't think they're going to get in. I don't think that they're building towards anything. They're spinning their wheels. They were talking about the coach last week. Uh, the true story in this game and the story outside of us and, and Canadian media is that this is almost the final nail in Seattle's uh, coffin, they're, they're, which is maybe a bad analogy considering what day it is and what happened earlier today. But anyway, uh, uh, forgive me. I don't, uh, yeah. True. Uh, the queen. Uh, the queen okay. is gone. I don't know Perfect. if you're aware of this, uh, yeah. I was hoping you were talking about the queen, and that's a buddy that died and I wasn't aware of. So that's great. No, no. Yeah. yeah. Uh, long, uh, the queen is dead, long live the king, right? That's the expression. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll see about that. Uh, all right. You're right. Vancouver is 40 points, ninth position, 32 games played. They are three points back of the Galaxy in seventh position. Uh, Salt Lake is also in striking distance. They have. 43 points. Seattle, Dwayne, is 10. They have 39 points. They have three games remaining. So a possibility of nine points. It is possible for them. They do have a game in hand, but they are four points back. And while you uh, talk about Seattle, I will look at their upcoming schedule because it's not just winning. It depends who you're playing against. Yeah, and look, I think even if Seattle sneaks into that seventh place, which they can then hold up and say that they kept their streak alive or not, I don't see them going on a run. I mean, they don't score enough. They're right mediocre across the board in their offensive numbers. They haven't had that spark since the CCL run. It, you know, sometimes, you know, a cigar is just a cigar. And that's a team that had to peak early in the season and couldn't ever get going again. And, and it is difficult to maintain the type of excellence that they've had for as long as they've had it and to come back not to mentally physically we can we understand mentally as well to come down from from what would be their their high yeah. mark of their franchise uh you know what back in the springs so that's a very difficult thing to do yeah and, you know i agree but i've also looked at who they're playing and outside of one team you could call this a cupcake schedule easily Cincinnati is not going to be easy. They're playing Cincinnati on Tuesday, September 27th. And then they're playing Kansas City, but on the road on October 2nd. And on Decision Day at 5 p.m., they're playing San Jose Earthquakes in Seattle. So they can get two wins out of there. We'll see. It's going to be interesting this end of the season. Yeah, well, it really comes down to to which of the teams from 7, 8, 9, 10 that decides that they want to win a couple of games is going to probably get in. But as I said, I, I don't think it really matters. Like Seattle's just not a t- contending team to me this year. Uh, you know, to win, I think that when as long as they keep this format, the single game elimination road games, you're rarely going to see teams that are near that bottom make a run all the way to MLS Cup. That's not going to be a common thing to happen. To win one road game, that's one thing. To win four road games, that's quite another. To win an MLS Cup, you do that, God love you. you you've, you've earned yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's yeah. true. And as we can look now at what the playoffs would look like if they would start right now in the Western Conference. Austin would be second. They would face LA in round number one. Dallas, Minnesota would be the three and six matchup in the Western Conference. Nashville, Portland would be the fourth and five matchup and LAFC would have to buy. Then LAFC would face the winner of Nashville and Portland. Dallas, Minnesota winner would face Atlanta, uh, sorry, at Austin or LA. So that is your Western Conference bracket. And if Greg Vanny and Chicharito and of course the LA Galaxy get hot, well, you can have a Nel Trafico in the conference final. That's the only place they can meet in the playoff as you see the bracket on your screens if you're watching us via youtube or twitter live if you're listening to the podcast thank you for listening to the podcast and if you could take a second and subscribe to the podcast rate and review this would really help our standings we're trying to make sure that we're noticeable we've been here for a long time and sometimes it happens with the old shows because we can consider ourselves old as an old show it's hard to discover thank you for your five-star review on all your podcast applications. Yeah, we've been podcasting since 2014. In the podcasting world, that makes us about 95, I would think. So yeah, we're, we're an old show. Um, and I was podcasting even longer than that, 20, uh, 2008 to 2012. So the only year I didn't podcast since 2008 to 2013. I'm old. That's the gray you can see on the beard if you're watching this live. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, yeah, but you know, uh, when I look at this Western Conference playoff battle and the Western Conference bracket, it's hard to see LAFC as not the favorite. They have clinched the top of the Western Conference, by the way. But there's something about Carlos Vela, big moments and failures that the playoffs and LAFC just give me. I feel like they have to shake the yips 
before I can fully get behind the project. Yeah, I mean, look, that's always when a team's had a few hiccups in the past. You're going to want to see them win there before you believe it happens. Um, what I don't like, or sort of what I, I like, don't like, I guess, whatever, is you show it's a bracket there. And a bracket's great for you because you only have to build it once and move the, the teams around a little bit. Exactly. A bracket, to me, is not good for competitive balance because they should be receding after each round. I don't understand why they can't in a single elimination because you look at that right now, and again, this could change. That is an easier ride from the top half of that rack bracket because you look at Portland Nashville. That's a, a top to four or five game, oh, Nashville, and then you have. You're right. You don't want to play Nashville. Nashville could yeah. be the dark horse. Hani Mukhtar, 23 goals in MLS. He's top of the league. You do not want to play against Nashville in a one-game playoff because, as we know, it could be nil-nil and Hani Mukhtar can score one late, and then you have no chance to respond. And Nashville could move on. And the Timbers are king of knockout, too. So either of those teams are going to be a tough out, right? And you look at the top half, you have a lot of questions. Austin's a second-year team. You don't know what they're going to react to a playoff situation. Obviously, they've had a good year. They've slipped a little bit in the last little while. But you're still not real willing to – I'm not willing to put all in on them yet, right? Dallas is a young team. Who knows how they react in the playoffs? They've had a decent season. Minnesota, yeah, who knows, right? But it's 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 not – it's lopsided. I just – I don't like the way the brackets. I don't like the single elimination. I don't like the brackets. Yeah. I understand why they do them. It's just I would I love the two game sets. It made more sense. I understood there was an international break in the in the middle, and this year's completely different. You got to put this year on a shelf because it's yeah. you're never gonna have a World Cup in November again. So don't worry about this year. But yeah, two game uh, ties, uh, man. That's the, the unless, drama. Those yeah. unless the ratings are really good in the states uh, during Christmas everywhere, and then maybe they're like, wait, let's do. A World Cup every two years? One of them is in November, one of them is going to be in the summer. Okay? No, that's a terrible idea. They're, of course, going to do that, you know. Yeah, the, the Winter World Cup. Uh, yeah, I. who knows? Anyhow, but look, uh, it, it's hard. I'm in Toronto, obviously, and the people here tend to tune out. And that happens a lot of... Uh, market so you tend to tune out as the playoffs go it's the irony of, of covering mls over the years is you find that the your best ratings on shows like ours are in the spring when everyone's excited and as teams get worse the, the ratings drop yeah. off well yeah, i'm encouraging you to to stay with it the playoffs are a wild ride in this league yes and uh, of course uh toronto never helps to, for for the rating when they when toronto sucks it doesn't help the rating in hockey or anything else well in hockey i guess we're used to it so it's not a good reference but everywhere else it is not necessarily great Speaking of Toronto, uh, a team that is officially based in Toronto, and the Canadian men's national team, is now in Bratislava, Slovakia, Dwayne, because they are getting ready for their two friendlies that they will be playing later this week. Two friendlies, one against Qatar, and that will be in Austria at the Franz Horst Stadium in Austria against Qatar. Qatar has a couple games that will be taking place in Europe against a couple of other teams. And Uruguay against Canada, this one will be taking in part in Bratislava in Slovakia at Tehelne Pol, which is the stadium there that they will play against Uruguay. Two friendlies for Canada, and of course, earlier this week, they well, last week, I guess, they unveiled their roster. And for the second time in his career, he was there in a camp, and now he's there for a full camp and games. Joel Waterman, Canadian Premier League standout, has made the roster. Here is your roster for the Canada Games in September. In that, no surprises, we have uh, Milan Boyan, Maxime Crepeau, and Dane St. Clair. No surprises here. Defenders, the big surprise is, of course, Joel Waterman being included in this one. And it's congratulations, first of all, for Joel Waterman. It has been a big target of his to make the national team he does want to play in qatar hopefully he get a chance to impress here it's the last chance to make the roster in my opinion but he's here it's his chance to maybe be impressive in training enough to get a chance to play in a game that's according to john herdman last week i was on the press conference and when he was mentioning for joel waterman he needs to show that he can play against Alfonso Davies and Jonathan David in training. And if he does so, maybe he will play against Qatar. And maybe he's going to get a chance to go to Qatar. But the big thing here for him is to play really well against Alfonso Davies. Well, yeah, you might, which is not going to be an easy task even in training. Obviously, uh, the speed that he has to deal with there. Look, Waterman, one of his great advantages is, of course, he has 
good continuity with Miller and, and Johnston. They he, they play together. They, so you can understand that they're going to fit in. They're going to understand each other's tendencies. There's going to be some some um, familiarity there that they're going to be able to work upon. And that that's a, a check for him. That said, he's still going to have to earn this. And especially when you're talking about the bottom three or four roster spots, which realistically that's what Waterman is gunning for. And, you know, his guys he'll be competing against is probably Daniel Henry, who who obviously is struggling to get playing time right now. And as um, struggling when he's playing also. Okay. <laughs> well, Kevin, are you remembering the play on the baseline where the player got beat? Because that wasn't Henry. He actually played well in the Montreal game in the second half. There's, I've looked yeah, at but there's other, there's many, uh, a few yeah. opportunities over the last few games, but yes. Okay, okay. Anyhow, Edward guy he has a, he hasn't played a lot under Bob Bradley. He's sort of been catching his legs. But anyhow, regardless, the bigger issue I think for Waterman is overcoming what will be not just an instinct for loyalty on John Herman's uh, behalf, which is going to be there, but also uh, chemistry in the room chemistry. If you're talking about guys that aren't going to play realistically a lot at the World Cup, the, the folks that are taking up those bottom spots aren't always the best players. They're the best guys that fit the group. And Henry's been with them for longer, so that's that's an obstacle Waterman's going to have to overcome. Sure. He's going to have to demonstrate that he is so much better than what he could be, that he can overcome that that difference in chemistry. Yeah. And, and again, he, he does have the the two guys yeah. that he plays with day and day that, that helps in that regard too. Exactly. So we'll see which way it falls, but that's the biggest change in this lineup. There's a lot of strikers. There's a lot of forward in this. There's 10, Dwayne. So, Charles-Andres Brim for his second time. He was in a camp earlier this year in June, but hasn't seen the pitch. He is this time around back with the national team. Tejan Buchanan, Cavallini, Corbanu, Jonathan David, Davies, of course, Alfonso Davies is here. Uh, David Junior Oilet, and we have uh, Lucas Colosho, Kyle Aaron, and Ike Ugbo. Uh, maybe Luca Colosho will be able to see the field and cap tie him if it's possible this could be one of the objective of the camp but to me it's interesting to see how the midfield will be doing without atiba hutchinson but with ismael kone in this one yeah just a quick uh clarification here you can't cap tie in a friendly it's only in a in a uh, nation's oh, league game go. or a world cup or qualifier world cup. or okay. gold cup or world cup game um or a gold cup qualifier which is nation's league anyhow it, yeah, look, the, those guys are coming in to be looked at for those bottom half of the rosters. Now, when you're talking about Kone, you're, you're looking at a guy that is going to have a different role. You, you, that would be an impact sort of sub kind of thing that they'd be looking for there. Is this a guy that he feels has enough dynamicism coming off the bench late in the game that he could change something? So he has a different sort of uh, different sort of uh, task. He's got to impress in a in a dynamic way, whereas I think Waterman's got to impress in a consistent way, and that's a different sort of skill set to draw into. Um, look, it's it's great to have a conversation like this. It's I've been covering as we talked about. We're old. We've been well, I'm old anyway. I don't want to talk to you, Kevin. Uh, I've been talking with Kate Nashley for a lot of years, and usually at this window, just before I woke up, we'd be talking about setting up for the next cycle. <laughs> we'll be not crying. setting up for the actual thing. <laughs> yeah, usually at this point, we're somewhere in a dark room, uh, sobbing in a little ball, curled up, and saying that you know I'll be okay one day. But yeah. this time around, we're we're actually taking part, so that's great. Yeah, the roster would be like average age 18 and we'd be like excited over, you know, Kevin Elliman getting a cap, which I can still, Ooh. I was at the pub the day Elliman Ooh. got cap tied. We were like, well, yeah, we got Elliman. He hasn't played six. Yeah, he hasn't <laughs> played a single minute since, you know, that's what happens. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. it's an interesting time. But speaking of, Vanessa Gill is uh, leaving Los Angeles at the Angel FC of Los Angeles in the NWSL and she's going to to Europe. She's going to Lyon. It was her dream to play in the Champions League, which led her to leave mid-season. She's, a, she's just mentioned on social media earlier today, a big long post and thread that she was sorry to leave mid-season, but the allure of the bright lights of the Champions League has been a dream for her as a competitor, and she has the opportunity to play for Lyon in the Champions League, and she is now in Lyon with the club and has left the Angelinos, but uh, she is very thankful for her time in the NWSL and she's been, of course, growing over the last few years with being part of that gold medal team with Canada. She is now going to play in the Champions League as a Canadian player once again in the Champions League. We have a few now with Kadisha Buchanan and more. It's a great time once again for our national teams. 
Yeah, yeah, well, it continues the tradition of Lyon, which is right now the the king, the queens, I should say, of Europe in terms of uh, of their winning the Champions League over Barcelona last year and in a decisive way. Actually, Barcelona, the heavy favorite in that game, and Lyon went and showed them who was boss still. Uh, you know, Katisha McCann had played for that team for years. She's moved on to Chelsea now. Only a couple of months later, they bring in another Canadian, a key Canadian on that gold medal team. And uh, and look, this is a remarkable journey for a player that just five years ago was playing, you know, in Ottawa in a League One Ontario team. And, and to go all the way to the, what is, our, well, not arguably, is, has proven to be over the past 10, 10 years the best women's club team in the world in Lyon uh, is a remarkable journey. And congratulations to her. And it, it is great to see another Canadian play the top league. I think on a, on a more global sense, for our American listeners particularly out there, this is a... To me, little moves like this sort of show the growing pull of that Champions League as a competition, and the NWSL is really going to have to address that in some way. And I think there's room within the women's game, and I've always said this, to not be so tied to tradition. Maybe even you could have the global comp- global club competition that means a little bit more. That's the way you can combat that. Maybe even you play in it. I don't know. Can you get over the I know it's European championships, maybe. I'm just thinking outside the box because I think when it comes to the women's game, that's a great advantage of it. You can't think outside the box. But it is, if you're an NWSL loyalist, it is a bit troubling to see players leave in the middle of a playoff push because they're they're, they're drawn in by this Champions League, which is getting bigger and bigger and bigger each year. You're seeing it, especially now in, in the English League, the competition in there and the media coverage it's getting. It's 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 great to see, but it's, it's really, uh, the NWSL has some work to do to keep up and, you know, speaking of that, we we also have some work to do in this country to make sure that we have teams here that yeah. are fully professional soon, so that players don't have to leave our country to develop and can yeah. maybe have some high level pro uh, women's sport for us to support here as well. Well, hopefully this continues, and now there's actually somebody in Montreal being paid to work on the women's project, whichever that looks like, wherever level that looks like for CF Montreal. Amy Walsh. Uh, great name in national team history and of course she does the play by she does color commentary for tsn 690 for cf montreal's game and she's been hired by cf montreal to be the head of the woman project that has yet to be named or explained but it is already a great news for the women's game or for the game played by women because it's the same game on that note you can follow Dwayne and myself on social media at 24th minute and you can follow this show at soccer today sp and i hope you enjoyed our return on video thank you for subscribing to our youtube channel and you can find our youtube channel at youtube.com slash sports podcasting network i might be mistaken here by the address i hopefully am not it could be soccer today but just look for soccer today on youtube you'll find our youtube channel and on that note until next time for Dwayne rollins i'm kev laramie we wish you not only a great day but also especially a great soccer you can find the podcast version of all the shows we do on itunes apple podcast google play store TuneIn radio iHeartRadio, radio and anywhere you get your podcasts